So, uh, just to give an overview of what we're going to be covering today, this webinar will discuss how spirits producers can enhance sustainability within their organization through practical concepts. Um, areas of focus will be water conservation, energy conservation, pollution reduction, uh, waste reduction, and also community involvement, which is a big one. Um, concepts discussed could be applied to requirements for membership in our Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program. So from there, I'm going to stop talking, pass it on over to Mark Valencia, the, the man behind the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program, to give you a little background of our program and then jump into um, some sustainability tips. So I will pass it on over to you, Mark. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Caleb. I really appreciate that. So again, I wanted to welcome everybody to the uh, this uh, webinar. It's our first webinar of two webinars we host every year with the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program. So I'm Mark Valencia. I am a um, environmental scientist with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation Office of Sustainable Practices. Uh, we have some great concepts, some high-level overview ideas of sustainability in the spirits uh, industry and, and concepts and ideas that you could pro uh, apply to your program. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this uh, program, feel free to ask whenever you want. And if it's you know on topic with what we're discussing, I'd love to answer them as soon as you come up with those questions. If not, you're more than welcome to hold off till the end of the, uh, the uh, discussion and, and have, have those questions at the end. So uh, to start off, I'm going to do a, a quick overview of our office the programs that we have within our office, who we are, the Sustainable Spirits Program, and then we'll go into some of those more uh, in-depth topics on sustainability. So like I said, I'm with the Office of Sustainable Practices. We have several uh, organizations within our office that, ho that uh, work on concepts from business, community, state, government institution. Um, what I like to, to explain is the Office of Sustainable Practices is one of the limited uh, groups within TDEC that is that that is non-regulated, so we don't do any work on the regulatory side of things. I like to you know let people know we're not in the business of telling anyone what to do. Uh, we like to work with people, organizations, communities, businesses, schools. We like to work with all those organizations who want to go above and beyond environmental uh, regulations. So this is above and beyond the people who are doing you know or trying to stay within compliance. So we want to work with those ones who want to go above and beyond that. Some of the uh, programs that we oversee, we have the Get Food Smart Tennessee program. Uh, this is a great little quick introductory. So Get Food Smart Tennessee is a way to reduce food waste within the state of Tennessee. Uh, the Sustainable Spirits program partners with them every year. So Food Waste Awareness Week is this April. April 15th, we will be hosting several uh, events, normally at breweries, and we will be doing a bread to tap event where breweries will be taking food that would normally get discarded you know from bakeries you know if they're day olds or or anything like that uh they're still good they're still consumable but maybe they're not comfortable selling with it you know they may be stale or older uh usually this food items get donated usually to farmers or it, it goes out of the circle of human consumption so this is a way to bring that that food source back into the human consumption circle before it goes to composting or you know off to feed for other animals. Uh, so if you go to one of these events April 15th, uh, you will be able to try one of these beers that are made with uh, discarded bread. Uh, some of the other things we have coming up, the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Awards. Uh, every year we have a, an awards program that recognizes uh, individuals and organizations who are going above and beyond again for environmental sustainability. Nominations are open until mid-March, so if you have any organizations, individuals you'd like to nominate, I encourage you to visit our webpage and check it out and, and make a nomination. Uh, some of the things on the community side, we work with a lot of schools. We do pharmaceutical take-back programs, so every uh, police department within the state, I'm not saying every single police department, but a police department in every single county within the state has an, a, a spot for you to donate or, you know, dispose of your pharmaceuticals in a safe and environmentally friendly format. A state government institution, this is a lot of back of house stuff. This is where we're working on improving sustainability within state government. Uh, this is just a little description of the Sustainable Spirits Program, but a uh, high level overview for us is uh, this Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program is a free membership program for any brewery, winery, or distillery within the state of Tennessee. Uh, 
to become members. We'll go into more depth of that, but it's a free program for any of these individuals. And uh, there's certain things you have to meet sustainably wise to become a member, and we'll go into that. So benefits of becoming a member, you know, we have this unique branding. If you look on the right, there's a, a great logo you can take a look at and you have any member of our program has free use of this logo. Uh, we give them a window clean. They can display it proudly at their tap rooms, uh, showing that they are a member of this program. <clears throat> we have an interactive map uh, showing where all of our members are and some of the great sustainable practices they're implementing at their facility. So if, if any consumer is looking for our members, we have an interactive map that shows where they are, what they're doing and how to find them. From time to time, we write articles on our members and we like to promote what our members are doing within sustainable, sustainable practices within their facility. Uh, and a great benefit that I like to mention is we, ha we provide technical assistance. So uh, we'll go in depth with it, but you know, we write up a sustainability report for our members and we list recommendations. Uh, those recommendations are up to the, the individual and if they wanna implement them, they don't have to. But if they ever want to pursue them, we can provide some of that free technical assistance to show them how they can get there. Every year, we like to do a press release on our new members. So we have a new member event at the end of the year. And this is a great way to promote our new members. We do a press release. Every year, we, we've done a press release. Local media has picked up on it. And sometimes national media picks up on it and runs a story on our members. And if you go ever go to our webpage, we have a, plent we have a ton of interactive online resources, both for members even non-members can access it, <clears throat> individuals can access it to find, to look, to learn more about what to look for in a sustainable producer. Some of the promotional items membership members receive are in the middle, that is a the window clean that promotes our membership. Uh, this is what I was talking about where you can display in your tap room that you're a, you're a member of the Sustainable Spirits Program. Bottom left is a, win, is a, is a bottle uh, hanger. So this is normally, you can see hanging from the, the neck of a bottle of a beer bottle, whiskey bottle, wine bottle. It's printed on um, compostable seed paper. So there's, there's wildflower seeds embedded into the paper. So when you're done using this product, it actually can grow something new out of it. On the bottom right, they're coasters with our logo, but the unique, unique thing about these coasters, they're made out of recycled tire rubber. So we wanna not only promote what we're doing, but we wanna do it in a sustainable fashion. <clears throat> to become a member, um, you have to meet a certain criteria. We have a checklist of 49 elements on this checklist. You have to meet a minimum of 25 of the items listed on the checklist to become a member. Checklist items range from water conservation, reducing air and water pollution, uh, increasing your waste reduction at your facility, and community involvement. Some of these ideas specifically that are listed here, we're going to come, we're going to uh, give some brief examples and ways you can do that. Uh, not only just becoming a Sustainable Spirits member, but just uh, becoming a, a more sustainable, more environmentally friendly producer within the state. <clears throat> so to become a member, uh, the first two things you have to submit is your application and your checklist. In addition to the application and the checklist, which you can access on our webpage, you also have to submit your uh, last year's utility data and production data. <clears throat> so this would involve electricity, gas, and water, as well as your production. And what we do with that information is we make a water use ratio and an energy use ratio. And this is a way to show, you know, it may take you five gallons of water to produce a gallon of beer, or it may take you this many kilowatt hours of energy to produce a gallon of beer. This is a way to, like I like to say to producers, this is a great way to look at your overhead, how much it's actually costing you to make a product. And on our end, it shows how we can, how, much resources are being consumed within your facility. Um, this is a way to establish our baseline of, of what you're doing. And, you know, throughout time, because <clears throat> every year you're gonna have to resubmit this data. And this is a great way for you to see where you stand compared to your first year as a member of the program. Um, I like to show this data. <clears throat> uh, we compare them to national and international uh, averages. So we can show you where you stand amongst your peers. Uh, throughout the world or even within uh, the size of your facility. So those are the big three things we need from you before we, you can start the process of becoming a member. Once we've received that information, we will review all that information. We'll do a TDEC internal compliance check. This is a way to make sure you're uh, up and up within TDEC. So if you have some compliance issues, we wanna make sure those get situated before you can become a member. So if we do 
if there is a flag for some compliance issues, we'll let uh, the applicant know and we will work with them to get them back into compliance. We can get them talking to the right people. They can work with our small business environmental assistance program, which also was within our office and they provide free uh, confidential technical assistance to small business, small businesses with environmental concerns. Once we do the inter internal uh, compliance check, we'll send out an email, we'll notify that we're ready to do an on-site visit. During this on-site visit, <clears throat> I like to think it's minimally invasive. We will do a walkthrough of your facility, but we're just trying to verify some of the things that are listed on your checklist. <clears throat> I usually like to, to let people know that normally we usually find additional items that you can add to your checklist just doing the walkthrough. So I think it's a great way to see what y'all are doing and find some areas of opportunity and find things that you didn't, you may not even recognize that you're doing. Once we do that uh, on-site visit, uh, we'll go back to the office, we'll review the data, we'll review what we did, at, what we noted at the uh, on-site visit, and we'll develop a sustainability report. The sustainability report will cover everything from the checklist to your data that you submitted and what we've seen on our on-site visit. Normally we will find, you know, we will make recommendations in the sustainability report and with those recommendations, um, you can, you know, further your sustainable practices. These recommendations are strictly recommendations. You don't have to do anything with them if you don't want to, but the added benefit with that technical assistance we provide, if you ever want to pursue any of the recommendations we make, we can provide some of that high level technical assistance to get you started. A good example is, um, we'll, we'll talk more in depth, but you know, say a facility wants to switch to LED lighting. Um, we will go back to your facility. We can walk through, count the light bulbs, and see what type of lighting system you have currently. And we can show you, you know, maybe the ROI on, on switching to LED or, you know, show you how much savings you can make if you do switch to LED and, and what type of systems are available to you. Once we get that sustainability report written up, we, we give that to our, our, our applicants, and that's, that will come along with a letter of acceptance into the program. This is the checklist. There are four pages, so I, I don't expect you to see everything on there, but I want to show you what the checklist looks like, and it's designed for you to just walk through your facility and check off the things that you have going on in your facility. It covers water, air, waste. On the next page, we have energy, sourcing, community involvement, and maintenance. And then we like to leave a good section for you to, to you know, let us know other things that are, may not be listed on this checklist that you're doing as well. Uh, next steps for our program, we're always looking for new members, so if you're interested in joining the program, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, I have my phone and my email is open for anyone to, to take a look at. Additionally, we um, seek additional feedback from our members and stakeholders, so if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear about it. We want to make this program specifically for our members. We want to make it unique to them and, and beneficial to them. We're always looking for additional resources for our members in collaboration with other organizations. So if you have any recommendations, I'd love to hear them. Uh, one of the things we're working on right now is a value stream mapping for members. And I have a little graphic to show you what exactly value stream mapping is. And we'll go over that later. So some of the, uh, we're, now we're gonna get into some of the uh, concepts and ideas of improving sustainable practices within your facility. One of the things that I, I've seen that work goes throughout each each organization, whether it's a distillery, brewery, or winery, there is some type of practice uh, called clean in place or SIP. This is a way of cleaning vessels, tanks, uh, you know, systems that you cannot easily move. You have automated systems to wash these these types of equipment. Um, usually, it goes down the list. If you see this, you know, it starts from a pre rinse. Pre -rinse. Uh, this is the one I'm showing right now is particularly for brewing, but it can be applied to any other, you know, stainless steel vessel that 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 needs to be washed. So within within this example, you know, there's a pre-rinse, there's a cleaning cycle, usually a caustic, there's another rinse, and then there's an acid rinse to you know to try to neutralize some of the caustic. A acid rinse rinse can also be an acid wash, uh, depending on your cleaning cycle. Uh, they're they're all different, but normally there's a final rinse at the end of this. Uh, taking that final rinse solution, which is usually just water, you can use that as a pre-rinse for the next vessel over. So say you're cleaning three or four fermenters at once. You know, using that final rinse on the first vessel, you can use as your pre-rinse on your second vessel. This is a way of recouping some of that water that you're using and, and, and you know, being able to use that water again in a second cycle. Uh, 
Uh, additionally, this is a this is an interesting concept too. Um, this is a way of actually conserving water, reusing water, and and recouping some uh, energy through heated water. So in the brewing side and distilling side, usually you heat up a liquid. Uh, we call it wort in the brewing industry, and this is a sugary liquid. So normally when you brew or you distill, you get some kind of grain, corn, barley, something like that. You steep it like a tea in hot water. And what you're trying to do is extract all those sugars from that product and move that to a fermenter. Uh, usually you heat it up, uh, you boil it on the brewing side. You may not need to boil it on the distilling side, but it's still a heated up product. Taking that sugary liquid, you do need to reduce that temperature down to a temperature range that is viable for the yeast that you're going to use to turn that sugary liquid into an alcoholic beverage. Uh, to do that, Normally, you take that hot sugary liquid, run it through some type of heat exchanger, and get it to the fermenter. This example here is, is when it is typically applied to a, an organization that is taking domestic water just from your, you know, from your water spout, running it through a heat exchanger in which your your hot liquid, the wort or sugary liquid, is going through that heat exchanger as well. It's not contacting the water; they're they're both completely separate from each other, and you're using that that domestic water source to cool down that, that sugary liquid into a pitchable range to pitch yeast into. Normally, that hot water that goes to a heat exchanger usually just goes straight down the drain. A great way to reuse this, you know, preheated water, because now it's going from whatever your domestic temperature is, you know, anywhere 50 to 70 degrees, depending on the, the season, it heats it up, you know, depending on, on you know, temperatures and things like that, uh, plus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can take that preheated water which is clean, it's never touched anything, it's just gone through heat exchanger. You can either use that as a preheated liquid source for your hot liquor tank uh, to the next batch of you know, beer or distilled spirit you're making, or you can take that preheated liquid and use it for cleaning purposes. I mean, so now this can be used as your, your pre-rinse on your fermenters like we showed in the previous example. Uh, so if you look on the bottom left, you see where the water goes through the heat exchanger and it has, has three options. It can be reused for some kind of uh, uh, you know, brewing or distilling practice. It can be reused for cleaning purposes, or it can go down the drain. So there's, there's, and there may be, you know, additional ways to recoup this water and use it for something else. But I'm trying to show that this perfectly good water can be used for some other source instead of going straight down to the drain. Uh, air pollution. So this is just some, some, you know, high level examples of way to reduce air pollution at your facility. Having routine maintenance plans on a lot of your equipment, whether it's HVAC, uh, forklifts, uh, brewing, distilling, winemaking equipment, uh, the more efficient it runs, the less energy is used, whether you're using energy from the grid, uh, some kind of uh, ignition source, so whether it's natural gas, propane, or even you know gasoline that's used in, in some engines. Having those uh, routine uh, maintenance plan in place for these systems We'll make sure that the the, the uh, piece of equipment is running as efficient as it can and, and reducing the amount of uh, pollution associated with energy consumption. Uh, you know, in the brewing and distilling side, there's usually gas-fired kettles or boilers. Um, making sure those systems are running as efficient as possible so you're not wasting gas or you're, you're not using the heat as efficiently as you can will definitely reduce the amount of um, pollution associated with, with burning natural gas. Combustion alternatives. Um, a lot of the facilities I've been seeing nowadays are using electric powered forklifts. Another way to reduce pollution associated with, you know, gas or natural gas fired forklifts. Uh, providing vehicle charging stations, so promoting electric vehicles in, 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 at your facility is a great way to reduce some of the uh, pollution associated with a, uh, you know, a normal gas powered vehicle. Electric kettles, uh, this may not be applied to large facilities or large producers. But you know, using an electric kettle to heat up your liquid or wort or boiling is a great way of reducing uh, you know pollution associated again with, uh, with burning of fossil fuels. Another great way to reduce air pollution is CO2 recovery. So every producer, whether it's wine, uh, beer, or distilled spirits, during that process of yeast consuming that sugary liquid and turning into alcohol, one of the byproducts is CO2. CO2, um, you know, is not great for the environment, but it's just something that naturally occurs 
during the production process. Uh, there are systems in place that can, you know, recover that CO2, bottle it, or save it for use in some other uh, portion of the production process. Particularly on the brewing side, uh, beer is fermented out, you know, yeast is consuming that liquid and turning it into beer. CO2 is off-gassed. After that process is completed, normally breweries will take bottled CO2 gas and reintroduce it into the product to get it to the, per the proper carbonation level. Uh, finding ways to reduce that CO2 or recovering that CO2, whether using spunding valves where you just close the valve and, and naturally carbonate your beer, or finding a system that may, for example, Earthly Labs makes a, a, pro a product that collects that CO2, cleans it up, and, and bottles it for use in the in the brewing or whatever process you want, you know, just recovering that CO2 and turning it into another product. Waste reduction. So uh, this is, you know, a problem that we see not just in the distilling, brewing, or, or winemaking industry. We just see it throughout throughout the state. Uh, some great ideas, you know, that people do to reduce waste within their facility is finding a, a home for a lot of their byproducts. Uh, you know, spent grain from brewing or distilling or pomace, you know, the skins and seeds and stems from the winemaking process can be donated to farmers to be used as a feed source. Additionally, if you cannot find a farmer, you can also use this as compost. It, it's a great uh, base material for composting. Uh, recycling. We all, we're always talking about recycling in the state and ways to recycle products. Um, if you do come across a particular product within your facility that may be harder to recycle, we always, uh, you know, emphasize reach out to your local county solid waste department to see if there are sources or resources for recycling of certain materials. And if you still cannot find a home for them, reach out to TDAC, reach out to us. We can probably get you into contact with certain people, uh, organizations that may be able to use this and recycle it, but we, we wanna be able to see if we can find a home for, you know, some of these products. Create a green cube. Uh, every EFO, uh, sorry, every environmental field office in the state, there's eight of them. So that's the Department of Environment and Conservation has a field office. There's eight of them throughout the state. And then we have a central office in Nashville. Every single one of these, these uh, buildings has something we call a green cube. So a green cube is a way, is, is finding a space and providing a space to collect items that are normally harder to recycle, such as electronics, ink toner cartridges, batteries, uh, there's all kinds of different things that you can find homes for. These are just some high-level overview, but you can, you know, find everything else, whether it's collecting books, you know, to donate to a local area organizations, collecting clothing material, clothing items. Uh, you're, you're more than welcome to, to go as vast as you want, as long as you find a home for items that normally would have gotten tossed out. So uh, this green cube is a great way to collect some of those materials that maybe someone may not think about and just chuck in the trash, which normally should not be thrown in the trash. Um, a great way to make an effective green cube is finding a lead. So having, you know, that champion in your facility who, who love, you know, who are, are forward thinking with sustainability, you know, give them this, this great opportunity to provide a space to collect these items and find new homes for them. Having a champion makes a green cube way more successful. This is just a, a picture of the green cube that's at the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation Central Office in Nash, downtown Nashville. So there are bins provided to collect certain materials. So some of these bins are collecting batteries, electronics, ink toner cartridges. Uh, if you look on the top left part, there's books. So it's a take a look, take a book, leave a book kind of program. So, uh, you know, finding homes for books or things that you normally would toss out. So this is what our green cube looks like in the central office, but you can make it any way you want. And if you're ever interested, you know, we provide, we developed a lot of this signage so we can give you PDFs, we can give you uh, photo files if you ever want to create your own, or if you have questions about developing something similar to this, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. Energy. Um, energy is, you know, a, a great topic for reducing uh, pollution associated with energy, you know, uh, alternative energy sources. So if you look at this picture right here, that's a great view of Keg Springs Winery and the solar panels they have over their facilities. So it's a great way of reducing uh, the use of energy associated with, um, you know, TVA, the way TVA produces energy. So this is an alternative source of energy that Keg Springs Winery is using. Alternative fuels, so we got, we discussed that briefly. 
finding alternative fuel sources for, you know, whether it's your forklift, um, you know, your kettles, things like that. A great way to see where you stand as a baseline and developing ways to, to be more efficient with your energy consumption is get, do an energy audit. There's several organizations in our state that can provide energy audits. Uh, some may be free, some may be at a cost. If you're ever interested, you can reach out to us and we can find you some resources on being able to conduct an energy audit at your facility. Use Energy Star Appliances. Energy Star Appliances is also listed in one of the checklist items uh, for the Sustainable Spirits Program. Um, Energy Star Appliances meet energy efficiency standards by EP that were developed by EPA. They're, they're found to be more efficient than conventional appliances that aren't Energy Star certified. Uh, switching to LED, we gave you that example before. Energy Star LED lighting uses 75% less energy compared to incandescent lighting that's uh, the conventional lighting in most facilities. So just doing a quick, I'm not going to say quick, but using a low impact change like that by even just changing the light bulbs, if you can get away with using the same ballast or change out the light bulbs, uh, I want to say you're at 75%, but you can definitely reduce the energy consumed by just lighting your facilities. Heat recovery. So I showed you that example earlier about taking that water from your domestic source that you use to, to lower the temperature of your, your work. Uh, you know, finding ways to recover that heat. It may not even just be from a heat exchanger. You can also put a heat exchanger in an exhaust stack that's from your uh, boiler. So finding ways to recoup some of that heat uh, is a great way to reduce your impact on energy consumption. Community involvement. So there's plenty of different examples out there. I think I showed on the waste slide, there's a picture of everyone at Jackalope, uh, you know, picking up trash. So that's pick up for a pint. Pick up for a pint is a great program for anyone who can who can implement it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a pint. It can be a glass of wine. It can be, you know, uh, a cocktail made from the spirits providers. So if you have a facility and you have a tap room, it's a great way to get your community involved with cleaning up the areas around your community, as well as, as strengthening the bond of community in your in your area. Uh, so a pick up for a pint is normally, you know, you just go out for a couple hours. Your facility provides, you know, trash grabbers, trash bags, vests, things like that. Uh, you may work with your local area solid waste program so they can pick up these trash bags after you clean up all the trash. After, you, you know, a day of picking up trash, all the, the participants and volunteers get a free pint of beer, or like I said, a free beverage from your facility for, for cleaning up the community in your area. It doesn't necessarily have to be a pickup, you know, along the streets. I mean, if there are local area creeks, rivers, streams, lakes near you, Host the stream cleanup. Those are always a great and fun activity. Get yourself outside in the sun, near the water, having a great time picking up trash and getting a great beverage out of it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, local area community organizations that already exist for these cleanup events. So definitely, if you're interested, reach out to us. We might be able to find you an organization who can provide some of those resources or help for you organizing a cleanup event. Provide educational opportunities. A uh, great way is, you know, just explaining that logo if you're a member of the Sustainable Spirits Program. We also provide uh, pamphlets on the program and in the pamphlets it shows uh, examples for consumers of what to look for in a sustainable producer. Being able to provide some educational opportunities, like even if you're doing a pickup for a plant or a, clean, a stream cleanup, it's a great way to provide education on top of what you're doing within the community. So educating the community on, on ways to become more, becoming more sustainable. Even if you're doing a, a tour of your tap room or a tour of your facility, uh, point out some of the sustainable practices that you're implementing. It's a great way to show people what you're doing to reduce your impact on the environment. And again, promote that Sustainable Spirits logo. It's a great way to show people that, that you're proactive in that approach. Give back. So whether it's charitable contributions or donating your time within your community, just being active in your community is a great way and a great opportunity to educate the community on environmental practices. And then providing a space, you know, if, if your tap room has the space or the ability, just being able to provide a, a space for community organizations just to meet and discuss whatever uh, programs that they are working on. So just providing a space to the community is a great way to be part of the community and giving them opportunities to, to utilize your facilities. A lot of these things listed right here uh, apply to the sustainability checklist that we have for our program. One of the last things I was going to show is an example of value stream mapping. 
Um, this is really in depth. Um, we're currently working on some educational resources for people who are interested in value stream mapping. But what value stream mapping is, is a way to map consumables along the process of making a product. So this is a high level, it's not perfectly, you know, developed, but this is an, an example of going from a delivery of grain to almost at the fermenter for making beer. So you get this grain, you know, some large facilities have storage silos for these. So you got to move that grain from delivery truck to the silo. Well, there's some kind of electric motor running an auger or some kind of pump source to move that grain to that, that silo. Um, if you just, you know, just going out there with a stopwatch, showing how long it takes for you to run that. So you have an electric motor with all the detailed information on that electric motor. Um, and you have the time that that electric motor ran for, it can give you a great idea of how many kilowatt hours it takes for that one particular process. You can take those kilowatt hours and determine the energy associated with that one particular step in the process. Aside from that, it'll also show you how much it actually costs you if you know how much you're paying for energy. So it's a way to show you um, from each process how much it costs you and how much, whether it's energy associated with electric motors or gas, associated with a, a kettle for uh, mash tons or oil kettles. Uh, so you have gas inputs, you maybe have an electric motor running that. So you have several things you can look at, whether it's water, natural gas, or electricity associated with that. And those all have costs, and those all have, you know, inherent uh, environmental concerns, you know, whether it's, it's energy consumption, so trying to be more efficient with that, be more efficient with the water you use, and efficient with the you know natural gas and the, the pollution associated with natural gas uh, burning. So this is just a way to to map out all the processes in this in uh, in your in your products. So whether you're making distilled spirits, beer, or wine, it's a way to, to just map those out and determine where your highest highest tax on your system. And by tax, I mean you know energy or water. What are the most costly ones to the environment and to your pocket? Um, that is my section. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out or you know post them right now. If not, we can go on to Jim with um, Jim Civis with Print Shop Beer Company, and he can talk about some of the the uh, sustainable practices he's implementing at his facility. He is a member of the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program, so I'm looking forward to hear what Jim has to say. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, you guys all hear me okay? Yes, again. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jim with Print Shop in Knoxville. Uh, we joined the Sustainable Spirits Program earlier this year, so uh, I can speak to the application process if you guys have any questions about it. Um, coming from a brewery and uh, but all in all it was relatively easy to get everything together uh, getting the information from KUB was probably the most time consuming because it was just downloading old um, reports invoices or whatnot uh, and then as far as doing the site visit with Mark that was probably about an hour and we talked through some things that he saw initially and also you know, he did a great job identifying some of the practices I hadn't really even thought about in terms of sustainability. Uh, let me go and switch this around so I'm not in the direct sunlight for you guys. Okay, so some of the things that Mark covered um, I think are gonna be very much uh, location and equipment dependent. So the water usage, um, we reuse water whenever we can, and getting the hot water from the heat exchanger helps with cleaning um, the tanks we use, the fermenters we use, and also the heat exchanger itself at the end of the day. Uh, we'll run that hot water back through to break up any sort of blockages, uh, and that keeps things running cleaner, uh, and we end up using less chemicals in the long run just to keep things moving smoothly. Uh, some of the other uh, aspects I don't think have been as applicable to us, though it's something we're looking to move into a little bit later on. So the air, uh, we're 
starting to get some quotes on some COT reuse systems and looking at uh, how viable they will be financially uh, for those who, you know, dealt with this CO2 shortage uh, last summer especially. Uh, it's something I really don't want to have to deal with going forward. And if we're able to produce CO2 internally and capture it, uh, I'd love to be able to sort of jump out of the supply chain there. Uh, I think the big ones that we can talk about uh, that Mark and I discussed previously, uh, the waste, one of the things that we do here is we're draft focused. Uh, so going into the COVID times, we were 100% draft. We had no canning capabilities. Uh, but since we've opened, we've also filled growlers, uh, which are reusable, generally half-gallon jugs uh, that our customers who want them filled uh, are able to bring them in. And we've got some extra hosing and equipment to essentially purge them and uh, make sure that the pores are level and of a high quality going into the uh, jar. Uh, you know, there are some challenges with educating customers on not opening them over and over again and expecting the carbonation to hold and then not to, you know, feel the effects of the environment once they're opened. But they're a great option for us and for some of our customers. Uh, on our end, you know, we end up giving them a discount based on what they would pay by volume because we're not providing any packaging material. Um, and it lets them essentially drink fresh draft beer. Uh, and if you know how to use or when to use the growlers, uh, they're great for parties. Uh, the winter is when we really pick up on growler sales. Uh, because we've got a lot of people coming in who want to share beer with friends and family who are coming over for a party or they want to give it as gifts uh, and it works out pretty nicely for them. Uh, we also now package crawlers which are um, the fill on site aluminum cans uh, and that ended up being a necessity with COVID uh, and tap rooms being shut down so we had an additional outlet for it. Uh, but even with those, the cans themselves are not reusable, uh, but they are aluminum, so they are easily recycled. Uh, but the packaging material that we use to get them to people's houses uh, are reusable. So we'll accept the pack text that we're able to put on top of them, uh, coming back in and reuse those, uh, which are a good option for customers who come in regularly. Or we also have uh, four-pack carriers that are cloth. They're really just wine totes that you may see at a liquor store, uh, but they fit the crawlers perfectly. And ours are a little bit shorter. We've used 25 ounces instead of 32. So you're able to fit eight in them, uh, which is a nice option for people. And they're a little bit sturdier. And again, they're reusable in our tap room, liquor stores, other places where people may get them filled. Um, on the uh, sourcing side, I think this is one of the places where it's not a heavy emphasis on the uh, sheet, the checklist, uh, but we source our packaging material. Uh, our crawlers come, I believe, out of Atlanta, so they're well within the geographic area we're looking for. Uh, but we also source a lot of our ingredients locally. Um, found that Riverbend Malt House in Asheville, North Carolina works with a lot of regional farmers, which include Tennessee, uh, and they're able to get us products uh, that we use for our base malts and some specialties. Uh, their equipment doesn't let them do some of the deeper caramelized or roasted barley, uh, but they do have a lot of heirloom varieties that you can use as the specialty malts. Uh, but, you know, we're sourcing grain from Virginia, from Tennessee, yeah, from Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, and everything was, is within, I think, 300 miles of Asheville, so they're able to keep things close, and it also works out uh, because I'm sure you all are feeling the pain of logistics these days. Um, we had previously been working with some of the nationwide malt suppliers and wholesalers, 
And I could order grain and it may not show up for two to three weeks, just depending on whether they were able to get trucks. Uh, one of them was actually located outside Asheville and they had to shut down that facility. Uh, so now everything we order from them comes from either Ohio or Chicago, um, which is a little bit frustrating because it's increasing our costs, increasing the carbon footprint and taking longer to get here. Uh, so if you guys have any questions about River Bend or local sourcing, I'd be happy to answer to the best of my ability. But, you know, they are a little bit more expensive uh, as prices have risen across the industry over the last few years. So it's not nearly as far above uh, the national suppliers as they were. And for us, being able to use local product and have it here in a timely manner and you know they're very reliable that's been well worth uh, the additional cost i think um, community is sort of the other big one that we do well at print shop uh, so we like to view the tap room as a community space where groups can come in uh, to meet uh, we've hosted all sorts of events uh, for outside groups coming in we'll put on our own uh, but some of the ones to touch on what Mark was talking about earlier, the pickup for a pint, I think we've done three or four uh, so far in the last 18 months, and they've been pretty successful. Uh, we usually have between 20, and, or we've had between 20 and 35 people show up for them. Uh, and when we have that many people working together, we're able to cover a lot of ground and pick up a lot of trash, uh, which is helping to you know, make the area more appealing to come down here. Uh, it's great because families will come out and we'll have some kids helping out and pitching in and getting a feel for community involvement. Uh, and generally, you know, we're cleaning about a mile of train track and a mile of roadway. Uh, you know, we've gotten well over a couple tons of trash uh, across the four events, so it's been very successful. They are a little bit, um, they're not easy in and out sort of events because it takes some advanced planning to get all of the equipment in terms of picker uppers, vests. Uh, Keep Knoxville Beautiful is who we partner with when it's time for these things. And I assume that the various other, there are various agencies uh, throughout the state that would fill that need. Uh, but being able to find the date and set up the logistics is certainly a little more challenging uh, than some people would have you believe. Not that it's overwhelmingly so. Uh, and then making sure that you have a place for all of that trash to go. Uh, so generally we'll fill our entire dumpster uh, off of what we pick up that day. And then from there, any of the bigger items, couches, tires, and whatnot, we'll need to run down to um, a waste disposal site uh, throughout the city. Let's see, uh, I mentioned community meeting spaces and this can take any number of forms. We have some groups who come here regularly. Uh, we have bike groups who will ride out of print shop uh, and come back. Uh, and you know, just I wanna say a few months ago for National Architecture Week, we actually hosted two different events uh, for local architects around town where they were running uh, some charity oriented events with a design competition and also a uh, trivia night. So for us, it's worked out well because uh, if we're able to schedule them on what are typically slower nights, they do a great job of bringing in a crowd uh, and we're able to provide them the space that they need for their presentations, uh, the speakers, those sorts of things. Uh, so essentially they're getting the space rent free, getting an opportunity to promote their organization and it gives us some steady customers for that evening and then we end up drawing a lot of repeat customers out of it uh, for people who may not be familiar with what we're doing down here. Um, Let's see, other events we have, we'll do local or pint nights with local nonprofits where we'll donate a dollar from every pint sold uh, throughout that day. And this is another time when we ask them to be on site and sort of walk people through what it is that they do. Uh, it's a great way for them to catch up with each other who they may not see. You know, these nonprofits may not share an office with a lot of the people 
who are involved, but it gives them a chance to come together, and it also gives them a chance to recruit new uh, people to become involved, new volunteers or maybe new board members. Um, we have hosted uh, CSA veggie bread pickups here also. So local farmers and bakers uh, would have people subscribe essentially to a weekly basket and we would act as the host venue for this. So the farmer would be able to come in, set up, uh, and then their customers would be able to come in and pick up the produce uh, from here. When the weather is not great, it's a good option to be able to come inside. Uh, and also, you know, you're supporting your local farmers, your local markets. And for us, you know, we have some of those customers who would stick around and grab a beer or grab something to go. Uh, but a lot of them, it's just, you know, come in, use our space uh, as a community spot and you know, if you roll without purchasing anything, that's fine too. We're not asking anything of uh, these groups when we're hosting them. Uh, and the last one I'm thinking of, we don't do a lot of the um, rechargeable stations, but where we are in South Knoxville, parking is usually at a premium. So we actually offer discounts for people who get to the brewery on bike. We've got a large urban wilderness. Uh, about a mile and a half away with a lot of mountain biking trails. There are some good places to do some road rides around here too. Uh, so if customer comes in on bike, they'll get a dollar off their beers and you know, uh, some of them I think helps draw it in and others are just you know, happy to have an extra dollar off that they may not have realized. Um, but I think that's the big stuff I have in terms of uh, letting you know that I'm here for questions as we go forward. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, we I have two questions as of right now, and, and you know everybody in the audience, make sure you're using the chat box if you have any questions for Jim or uh, for Mark. Um, first question I had was, um, have you found an uptick in consumers concerned about sustainability at your um, facility, Jim? We haven't done a whole lot of promotion on the sustainability side. Uh, because it's just been within the past month that I'm still trying to wrap my head around how to best market it. Uh, I know I gave a tour this weekend, and uh, as part of the tour, we um, talked about sort of the brewing process along the way, and they were interested to hear about how, I guess, they did not realize all the steps that went into producing beer. Uh, but when we also talked about some sustainability things in terms of local ingredients, in terms of using our heat exchanger to get water ready to go for our cleaning practices, or even something like using concentrated hot products um, instead of the regular T90 pellets, uh, using the T45s or cryo versions, which means that we're getting a more basically twice as much oils in the same uh, weight of hops, uh, which cuts down on our storage space and also cuts down on transportation costs. Uh, I think they saw it as part of a holistic package here. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then we had one more question that says, um, what is something that print shop uh, would like to move forward with at their, at their facility? So I guess like, what, what's up next, uh, sustainability-wise, or, or or it doesn't have to be, you know, super sustainability-based, but uh, I guess the question was just, what what's next for you guys? Yeah, we're planning a round of expansion with, um, so we've been using coolers to keep our beer at fermentation temperature, and when we built the space out, we planned for expansion down the line, uh, and that meant certain things like, we have more space than we currently use, but as we do this round of expansion, we're gonna be getting jacketed tanks. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the possibility of having a CO2 recapture system, uh, because that's been, that was definitely one of the challenges last summer where I had to scale back production at times because I didn't know that we would have enough CO2 to carbonate and package the beers. Uh, so it, 
instantly decrease uh, our capacity for the year. But when we get the new tanks, uh, hopefully CO2 recapture system, we're going to be able to repurpose the coolers that we were using for additional cold storage. So it's a matter of, or for us, uh, the CO2 would be the big sexy thing, but being able to reuse what we already have in place uh, and essentially upgrade it with sort of smaller modifications uh, is great rather than having to go out and get all new coolers, all new units, uh, all new ductwork and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that you know some um, you know a lot of sustainability based uh, upgrades and, and and things that that you can put into your uh, facility also help with issues of you know like like you were just talking about um, yeah have that CO two recapture. You won't have to be so based on you know. Uh, logistics of getting that that CO2. It's sustainable, but it also helps your production and everything. So, um, I think that's all the questions that we have currently. Um, so, what I wanted to do is I wanted to put Mark's information here, um, and you know, if you have any questions about the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program, or or you you know have a a, a question that you wanted to ask Jim that you didn't think about till later, uh, there's Mark's. Um, contact information and his phone number. Feel free to reach out to him if you um, have a facility that you want to be a part of the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits Program. We're always looking for for new partners and um, always looking to, to uh, for outlets for our resources for the spirits industry. So um, I wanted to let everyone know that this webinar recording and the presentation slides will be available on the Tennessee Sustainable Spirits website. Um, and a follow-up will be sent out to everybody that registered and attended. Um, like I said, if you have any questions about the, the program, feel free to write down Mark's email and then send him an email. And um, like I said, we will be sending a follow-up for this webinar uh, by the end of the week. So thanks again, and everybody have a great rest of your week.